not exactly hidden. The nearest garden isn't. It's a gap in the pathways with a bit of fencing around it to let the nature of the area poke through. Tall trees swaying gently in the breeze and adding a little something extra to the scent of the ocean. Interesting, you sir. Are you aware you have some kind of axiom-based life force parasiting? Or perhaps symbioting in you? A higher-pitched voice asks from nearby and they look around. They don't sense anyone. Up here, I keep a distance to avoid scaring people. The source of the voice is a small furry creature. It's bipedal with long toes good for grasping and climbing, covered in immaculately groomed golden fur and has a pair of large pale blue eyes peering down. The tiny being waves an arm at them, even as its other is pointing a tripod-mounted device at them. Hello, don't worry about the scanner here. My kind cannot sense Axiom as yours does, so this just lets me do that. A try, Jade exclaims, and the tiny being nods. Indeed I am. I am Alrenoth, seeker of the Barkbinder clan. Are you the being that was terrifying the bright forest? Morg Arkin demands. I assure you, it terrified me right back. Alrenoth states before peering into a screen in the side of his scanner. Is that what you're carrying around, sir? The interplay of Axiom is like nothing I've ever seen before. Of course, the past few hours has been so filled with knowledge that I'm getting nearly a month's worth of data in just a day, vacation or not. You're on vacation, Slytherin asks. Well, my mechanic is. And if my mechanic is resting, then so is my ship. How did you know I'd be here? Morgar Kuhn asks. I didn't. This resort is the one my mechanic's staying at. My ship is docked in a more secluded part. I was just getting some scans in and then spotted something strange with you. Makes sense. I picked out this place because it's one of the cheaper and seedier resorts on the planet. More likely to get a prize, Slytherin says. A prize? What exactly are you trying to win? I'm a trainee bounty hunter and... Slytherin trails off as Alrenoth brings out a small notepad and pen and starts immediately writing things down. Keep going, Alrenoth says, and I baited in what I thought was a pedophile. It turns out that I accidentally tripped a police sting operation, and now a fully trained bounty hunter called J3 is speaking with them. Slytherin explains and Alrenoth nods. I see. Very interesting. And what are you four doing now? Relaxing? Wandering? Growing increasingly annoyed with a small, furry alien, perhaps? Alrenoth asks with a smile that's hard to see on his mouth, but the crinkling of his eyes ever so slightly is a good sign. How did a creature like you terrify the bright forest so badly? Morgar Kuhn asks. I'm keeping my distance. It's the best way to speak with people. Alrenoth remarks. Ah. Well, what I'm doing is a small experiment. Morgar Kuhn states. Truly? That sounds delightful. May I watch and record? I promise I will come no closer and not interfere in the slightest. Alrenoth asks, and Morg Arkan considers. The bright forest is being very, very quiet. He can see and hear the tree eye, but not sense it with axiom. Um, how does your resistance to axiom work? Morg Arkin asks, and Alrenoth chuckles. It has two constant states. Alrenoth begins as he takes out a few small devices and slots them onto his scanner. Right now it's passive and waiting to spring out. If I'm touched by a large quantity of axiom that isn't moving in the exact method that my body needs, then it automatically lashes out and shatters nearby axiom constructs. So you're a living trap? Something like that. One of the major predators of my homeworld, the Snap Maw, developed a phasing axiom ability. As a result, my own ancestors developed a canceling ability so that when a Snap Maw got too close, it would suddenly and violently be forced into a normal state of matter. This would knock out the dangerous creature and allow my more primitive ancestors plenty of time to escape. It was only when we developed into a tribal people we learn to truly weaponize it. It turns out snap maws are very tasty. 
and even to this day, their bones and teeth are used in jewelry. I see, and being in the bright forest would mean you're disrupting it, even if you're not touching any plant or animal there. Even hovering in mid-air, you'd be in the middle of a massive axiom construct and therefore have that defense out. That's right. It's almost as disruptive as Null itself when it comes to dispelling axiom effects, Alrenoff explains. The only way it isn't is that it still allows axiom to be drawn toward me in a calm and passive state, even when fully activated and actively dispelling things, which is why your deadly touch isn't deadly to yourself. That's right. We still live off axiom and live in an axiom-drenched galaxy, even if we can't use it, Alrenoth confirms. Now speaking of using Axiom, if you could please continue. Use this so I can have a copy of the data. I'd like to see this too, Jade says, tossing a data chip to the tri who catches it easily and slots it in right next to his main one. He then flashes her a thumbs up and turns up the feed. All right then, let's see how well the bright forest spreads, Morg Arkin says, as he reaches out and places his palm on the trunk of the tree. Something is happening, Alrenoth notes to himself as he watches the screen and keeps glancing back to Morg Arkin where all he sees as an Apuk man holding the trunk of a tree and looking mildly constipated. It's not spreading. What am I doing wrong? Morg Arkin demands. You are doing something though. Alrenoth corrects him and he nods. The effect you've got isn't penetrating into the tree, but spread along the bark for a few moments. It did? That's interesting. Maybe. Morg Arkun notes before he crouches down and places a hand between the roots, and then laughs. Of course. The bright forest is a mushroom forest. It's not of bush, tree, and shrub. Fungus live by different rules than plants. Rules I need to learn. Very interesting, very, very interesting, Alrenoth notes as he adjusts the focus on his portable scanner. I haven't observed an axiom construct like that before, but it bears a lot of similarities with the nervous systems of deep space leviathans. No doubt this would explain why they have such proportionately unreal reactions. Beings as big as a moon should not have the reaction time to dodge plasma with ease. Wait, those things are real? Slytherin asks in surprise and Alrenoth nods. Oh yes, my uncle has been spending nearly a decade just following one of them around. Alrenoth replies. Um, Slytherin begins. Oh, don't worry. Not all of them are hostile. Some species are downright passive. Alrenoth remarks. Now, if you'd like my observations, from what I can see on my scanner, there's a temporal entanglement of similar nature to Protnet. Similar, but not at all identical. You're currently in contact with that mushroom forest, aren't you? I am? Yes, and there's something else. Another pattern that's in the background of the field. What's interesting, though, is that a lot of these patterns are undergoing standard decay at a nearly identical rate. Were you hit with Null recently? I was, Morg Arkun says. And you, ma'am, you have the under-pattern that Apuk Man has, but also a second under-pattern that matches with the over-pattern that he has. Again, many of your Axiom patterns are undergoing decay at an identical pace. You were also caught in the Null? Yes, Maggie Kemka asks. How precise is that device? Extremely. After all, just imagine how obsessive your race would get if you were to find out that the entire galaxy can do something you can't and it's never going to change. Very? To put it mildly, yes, Alrenoth remarks. Hello? That's interesting. Mr. Sorcerer? I believe your title is? Yes, I am a sorcerer. You are aware that the mushrooms you sowed in the sand are now shifting and spreading, right? They're coiling around the roots of the tree and feeding themselves into the tree. Ah, so the tree was your goal and you're finding another path. Understandable. Alrenoth notes before making a minute adjustment of the sensor. Please continue, 
As they sit down in the back of the expanded police transport vehicle, J3 glances around. Three exits, plenty of weapons. Lots of things he can use for cover, including the table, which will make a terrible defense but an excellent visual block. He doesn't think this is some really strange ambush, but it's a good habit to keep up. Very well. You want to work with us, and I've received confirmation that they're still processing the sheer number of minor bounties you've brought in at the Balrin Archipelago, Officer Trine states. How much have they gone through? A fourth. You men are downright lunatics to bring in so many. We have a big ship in need of supply, and that means money, J3 states before sighing. All right, we're away from anyone possibly listening. We're out of the public eye. How bad is it, really? You were very cagey to actual numbers and just made it sound like a routine issue. But it's not, is it? No, it's not, Officer Trine admits as she deactivates a holographic projector hidden in an eyebrow piercing. She's in full war paint. We were looking for our in with this latest cabal. They're well-funded, well-organized, and very tight-lipped. We don't know their name or their members, but we do know that they have a very large stable of abused children. We suspect many of them are receiving constant healing comas to be returned to their youth over and over again, as well as to heal them after the more sadistic customers have their fun. Officer Trine explains, and J3 lets out a long breath of air at the implications. It would take almost no effort at all to get the mental imprint from the moment before you caught the kid and then you could sell the child over and over again as fresh goods and every single time it would be a brand new horror for them no matter how many times they underwent it. Well, fuck we have a full mission then. I'm going to call the captain, get him down here and get him talking. Just like that you're going to help us? Poor kids that need to feel safe and need stability in their lives are perfect recruits into the cadets. Even if it wasn't morally the right thing, even if we weren't liable to get a lot of money from the things we're inevitably going to loot from the bastards, we would still do it for pragmatic reasons. Of course, why do anything if it's not morally sound, pays well, and is pragmatic? An officer grumps and J3 slowly turns to look the platinum woman dead in the eyes. Even from a sitting position, he seems to tower over her as the sheer weight of his experience and training seems to descend into the room. Then Onyx smacks him in the back of the head. There are employers and allies. Lay off the scary soldier routine. Sorry, J3 says before reclining a little and visibly reacting. My organization is small in number, but big on skill, training, and efficiency. Intimidation, too? Officer Trine asks tartly. Intimidation is only mildly effective, but it is preferable to needing to use violence. You can apologize for scaring someone. Killing is a little harder to walk back. J3 states before sitting back up again. All business now. He pulls out his communicator and puts it on a specific channel. Captain Schmidt here. Captain, this call is being broadcasted. Slytherin sting operation stumbled into another sting. There's apparently a cabal of child traffickers on this planet and the local officers don't have enough information to act. Am I approved to fully cooperate? Confirmed. Our assistance to the ninja clan has effectively ended and they no longer need our help. I'll make sure the rest of the crew is informed about this next mission. Perhaps I'll even convince the ninjas to return the favor, Pukey answers. Acknowledge, sir. Good luck. Keep us informed, sniper. Captain out. Pukey finishes and the call ends. Well then, it looks like you have backup now, officer. What do we know and how can we help?